My name is Rose Scott, and I was born in Vienna, Austria, on January the 4th, 1929. So I just had my 90th birthday. When I went to school, we had boys and girls did not mix in school. We had the boys who were on one side of the school, it's a big building, and the girls were on the other side of the school. I had a friend, her name was Martha. She was my very, very best friend. She was Jewish. Her mother was one of the first lady attorneys in Vienna. And uh, we spent every free time that we had, we spent together. So when Hitler moved in, uh, we all know about who Hitler is, right? Okay, thank you. If there's something that you don't know what I'm talking about, just ask me, okay? And um, um, so when he moved in, our first my first experience with Hitler and the Gestapo was the election day. Did I lose something? No. Um, we, the election was in my school, and um, they had all kinds of big cars outside, like, like buses. And I wanted to go see, I had never been to an election, to vote, you know, election. So I wanted to see what that was all about. My mother didn't want me to come, but my father said, let her come, you know. And that was the biggest mistake I ever made. I was introduced right then and there to the Gestapo. Uh, we walked in and there was one podium with a big sheet of paper on it and had two circles. One circle said yes, the other circle said no. On each side of the podium was uh, SS soldiers. Those were Hitler's elite troops and Gestapo men. They were always in civilian clothes. They never wore uniforms. They always had civilian clothes on. And you recognize them by the insignia that they had. You know, and after a while you got to, you, you just had to look at them and you know who was Gestapo and who wasn't, you know. And um, so we got up to the podium and um, my mother was not going to vote for Hitler. That was completely out with her. But when she was reaching over to make the sign, the cross in no, the Gestapo men said to her, is this your daughter? And she said, yes. And he says, if you want to see her again, you better put yes in there. Because the people that voted no, the buses they had outside were buses to take these people straight to a concentration camp. That's, that's how it started off. So from that day on, we never, never, never had any peace. Our country was not the same anymore. Our religious instructions in school were canceled if you were a Catholic. So we had no more religious instructions. The churches were closed. We could not have baptism anymore, Holy Communion, weddings, anything like that that had to do with the church, you couldn't do it anymore. The priests could not do anything for you. If they did, they were taken to the concentration camp. So remember, it wasn't just the Jews that were in the concentration camp. It was everybody that was against his regime. And whether it was a priest or a doctor or a little child, it didn't matter. They took you straight to the camp. We didn't know at that time how many camps we had in the area. We didn't find that out until the war was almost over, you know. And uh, so anyway, my little friend Martha, I still was seeing her every day and she went to the same class with me. And uh, my mother said, don't be surprised if one day you come to school and Martha will not be there because the Gestapo is picking up all the Jews, you know. Just thinking of that would happen to her. I still get very emotional, so you have to forgive me. And sure enough, one day we came to school and the teacher said, now there will be some 
SS soldiers coming in here and some Gestapo. They're going to ask several students some questions. And don't worry about everything is okay, you know. And um, Maita was very petite, very tiny. She was sitting in the front row. I was always taller than the other kids, so I was in the back row. And when they walked in, they walked straight over to her. And my heart just sank. And um, they asked her questions and asked her her name, which she told them. Then they told her to get her up her stuff. She, they, she, she has to come with them. She turned around and looked at me. And I, I couldn't do anything. So I tried to stand up and say something. My teacher motioned me, sit down. You know, she just motioned me to sit down because if I would have said something, they would have taken me too, you know. So they took her that day and she lived in a beautiful villa uh, about half an hour from the school. And it was it's a long way to walk, you know. After this class was over, I ran all the way to her house. I wanted to see her, make sure she's okay. When I got there, they had everything blocked off, and the SS was there, the Gestapo was there, and I asked him if I could please go in to see her. They said, no, she's already gone. We took her to a nice place where all the Jews are going to be, and they're going to be very happy there, you know. And I said, well, can I just talk to one of their servants in there? And they said, no, there's nobody left in this house. So I ran home again, and I told my mother, and I didn't stop crying. This is the last time I saw her, when they took her out of the class. So you can imagine the fear I had for her, because she was so fragile. I know she wouldn't survive in a concentration camp. You know, and it was short time after that my uncle uh, met me in the basement of our building, which I was surprised because he never he didn't live with us. You know, he never came to the basement, and he said, "I need to talk to you." Am I going out of term? Well, the note first came. Oh, the note, yeah. I came out of class and a, a little boy came over and handed me a note. And it was from my uncle, he wanted to see me, you know. So we made arrangements to meet and he explained to me what he was doing. He was working for the underground. The underground is people that help the Jews to find hiding places, to find food, to some of them to help them to get out of the country where it would be safe. And uh, it was a very, very hard job. You really had to be strong and sincere wanting to help these people because if you weren't, you couldn't have done it, you know. He didn't know how I felt about the Jews because I haven't seen him about it, I haven't seen him in a long time. So anyway, I met with him and he asked me if I would be able, he knew I couldn't find hiding places because I couldn't tell. He said, don't tell your mother, don't tell your father, don't tell anybody in the family. If you're going to help me, don't tell anybody. So um, what he was doing besides finding hiding places for them was trying to gather food up to give, bring to them because they had nothing to eat, you know. So that was my job, and it wasn't easy, because we, at the same time, we didn't have anything to eat. So my mother still had some stuff in the basement that uh, we uh, preserve during the summer for the winter time, you know. And um, so I tried to take some of that, but I couldn't take too much because she would notice it. My grandmother lived in the same building with us, so she was very generous, but she didn't know what I was doing. I told her it was some poor kids in the school, you know. And that hurt me because uh, I was, as a Catholic, I was brought up not to lie. 
and I never lied so much in my life as I did in those years. But uh, anyway, um, so we had a... While you kind of compose yourself, let me just explain her situation here. She's living in an apartment building. Her uh, grandparents live in the apartment above her, and she's in the apartment with her parents below that. And then in the basement, everybody in the apartment building had a, a room in the basement where they could store things. And that's what she's talking about, where her mother had stored some canned goods and potatoes and whatever kind of goods down there. And that, that uh, storeroom had a door and a, and a lock that they could lock so that it was just for that apartment. So that's what she's talking about. That was her living situation. And of course, we're talking about, uh, I failed to mention this earlier, perhaps you picked it up by now, that she, was, uh, she grew up in Vienna, Austria. And just to back up just a little bit, when Hitler came to Austria, Austria was considered like a wing of Germany. They spoke a variation of German. And so when Hitler first moved in there, he was, there were certain Austrians that welcomed his move. They welcomed Hitler, but there were others that didn't. And the election she's talking about earlier, where they voted, was Hitler wanted to make it look like that he was being accepted and wanted people to elect him to come and agree with his government. And so it was really a rigged election. Like she said, if you voted no, then you were off to a concentration camp or somewhere. But it was just a false election to make it look like the people of Austria wanted Hitler there <coughs> and to establish his regime in Austria. So uh, go ahead, I just wanted to make that clear. So I used to meet my uncle at different places, at the cemetery. At, I used to go to the cemetery a lot to put flowers on my family's graves. And I used to meet him there and, and at the football field and, of course, in the basement most of the time. And uh, he told me to be very careful and not say anything to anybody, which I didn't. And. I was, can I go ahead and tell that my first? Sure. Okay. I did, always did my, my homework in the kitchen. I think some, some people here like to sit in the kitchen too, you know. And um, I was doing my homework and the, the kitchen window from the kitchen looked out on the foyer but it had two little curtains on the, on the window so you couldn't really see who was out there. There was a knock on the door and I got up to see who it was and it was two SS soldiers and some Gestapo men and they said, um, put on your jacket, it was winter time, uh, you have to come with us, we need to ask you some questions. And I told them, I said, uh, I am doing my homework and I can't go anywhere without telling my mother. My father was in the army, in the German army. Uh, I can't leave. Am I okay? Yeah, I think you're okay. And they said, don't worry about that. We'll notify your mother, but you have to come with us. Well, I'm just thinking of that I'm going to the Gestapo headquarters. I didn't want to let him know how scared I was. I was very, very scared, trust me. But I didn't want to show it. We got there and um, they put me in a room, small room with a table and a few chairs. And they said, well, we're going to send somebody in to ask you some questions and you better tell them the truth. So sure enough, they came and asked me where, is my, where my uncle was. I said, I don't know. I haven't seen him in a long time. And I'm a bad liar. I have, to, you know, I guess they could tell I wasn't telling the truth. But anyway, and what, where is he? And when do I bring him the food for the Jews? As I, and I told him, I never bring food for the Jews. I don't know what you're talking about, you know. That went on. Well, all day that day and the next day. And then they came in and they said, well, I guess we're not going to get anything out of you. 
just talking to you, we're going to have to do some more drastic actions. And I prayed so hard to God that I could be strong enough not to tell him where my uncle was and what, what I was doing, you know. And I, t I let you know right now, my faith is the only thing that, that got me through this thing. I knew that God would help me. And no, it doesn't matter what church you go to, it doesn't matter, but keep your faith in God. Trust Him with all your might. So they came in and they made me roll up the sleeves for my sweater. And they had cigarettes and matches. And they took the cigarettes and put my sleeves all the way up to my neck. And they took the cigarettes and the matches and they dug them into my skin. And it hurt so bad and you could smell the skin where they burned it, you know. And especially when they got up to the neck. I wanted to scream, but I, I didn't. I cried a lot, and I said, please stop, please stop. And they said, we're not going to stop until you tell us what we want to know. And I said, I can't tell you because I don't know anything. At that time, at that time, I was not scared anymore. I was angry, so angry that they would do that to a little girl. So I said to myself, can you imagine what they're doing to those people in the concentration camps when they do this to a little girl? Anyway, that went on for another day. And finally, they gave me money for the streetcar and told me I could go home, but they would see me again. And next time wouldn't be that easy for me. Well, I went outside. I got the next streetcar to go home. and. Uh, my mother was furious when I came in because they did not notify her where I was or what they were doing to me. And uh, so before, before she cooled off and everything, she let me tell her that what happened. She, she couldn't believe it and she just cried. She called my grandmother down and my grandmother put some salve on me. I looked like I had a disease, you know, all that stuff was sticking to my skin. Would, from the, from the burns. I c couldn't go to school the next day because I was in such pain. I mean, tremendous pain. <coughs> I didn't see my uncle for quite a while after that because my, my mother had a feeling that I knew where he was. And, but I couldn't tell anybody. So it went on like that for weeks and weeks and then it happened again. The Gestapo came to the house and they said, uh, get your stuff together and come with us. This time I was really frightened because I knew they said next time it won't be that easy, you know. So we went back to the Gestapo headquarters and they had me in, this little, in a little room again for two days, didn't give me nothing to drink, nothing to eat, didn't come in to ask me any questions or anything. And finally they came in and they said, okay, are you ready to tell us what we want to know? And I said, I tell you anything I know, but I don't know what, what my uncle is and I don't know nothing about taking food to the Jews. So they said, okay. You have to tell me the next part because I, 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 I can't. What they did, um, like she said before, this room had a small table and like four chairs and she was sitting in one of the chairs. So one of the SS troops came over and took the table that was in front of her and just threw it across the room. And then he brought one of the chairs and put it directly in front of her chair. and took her heels of her feet and put it up on the chair. If you can imagine what I'm saying, the chair is here. So he took both feet, put her heels up on the chair. And then he brought up a third chair and put it perpendicular to the other two chairs. And he got up on top of this chair 
and proceeded to jump onto her knees. She's about your age, any one of you girls here in the front row, about your size, and uh, he's a guy weighing probably uh, 200, 220 pounds. So you can imagine her little legs are no match for his weight. And she not only broke her leg, she had what's called a compound fracture. The bone came through the skin and was exposed right at her knee. So she was in shock from that point on. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about this when I interviewed her about this, and it was just excruciating to the point that she couldn't comprehend what had happened to her. And, and she did realize at the last second what was about to happen. I mean, she did realize this guy's going to jump on my legs, and she went, no, no, please, no. But he said, you get what you get, and jumped onto her leg. Um, after that, you would think, well, they would show some mercy. I'm sorry, got my back this morning. Show some mercy and, uh, you know, get her medical attention. Instead, one of them, one of the SF troops, grabbed her up in his arms and proceeded to take her outside into the snowy winter. There was slush, you know how snow starts to melt after a while and there's just a pile of it along the curb. He takes her out in front of the Gestapo headquarters and tosses her into the snow. And so, Rose, you wanna pick up there with your story? <coughs> like, Gary says, I was in such pain. I just wanted, all I wanted to do is scream, but I didn't. I just cried, I couldn't stop crying. And I was trying to get somebody's attention to stop so I could tell them to notify my parents, my mother. And, um, but nobody wanted to stop because it was right in front of head, uh, Gestapo headquarters and everybody was terrified of the Gestapo. So nobody wanted to stop and, and talk to me. And finally, before, at that time, people didn't have telephones at home like you do now, you know. So if you want to get a message to somebody, you had to have a friend that had a phone that could take a message to your parents. And as it was, in the building that I lived in, there was a grocery store on the bottom floor. And whenever we needed to have a message sent to anybody from the family, we could call the grocery store and they would give him the notice. So I kept trying to, for somebody to stop. Finally, a very young man stopped and I said, please, I'll give you a phone number. Would you please, please call my, my mother and tell her I cannot walk, tell her where I am. They have to pick me up, you know. And I gave him the number. He didn't write it down because he wanted to get away from there as soon as possible. And that was about 8 o'clock in the evening, no, at 7 o'clock in the evening. And I sat there and I waited and I waited and I waited and nothing happened, nobody came. And I knew it was getting close to where the last trellis would pass by. And God put him on my mother on the last trolley and she came with a man from the, a friend from our building and they carried me on to the trolley. A trolley is a streetcar, I'm sorry, you know. And, uh, that's how I went home. There was no doctors available at this time because they had, uh, uh, all the doctors were out on the field taking care of the soldiers. And um, so they, nobody could set my knee. So I was like that for weeks and weeks until I finally found a doctor. But by that time it was too late to set it, you know. And um, I had to have surgery later on. But uh, it, it was just unbelievable. And that's what I mean. I, I, had, I didn't see my uncle after that for a long, long time because I couldn't get out of the house. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't do nothing, you know. So anyway, um, as Gary mentioned, I was a gymnast. 
Yeah, I didn't mention that part. I'm sorry. That's okay. We're going to go back. We're going to skip back to before her first visit to the Gestapo. Now, before that all happened, mm -hmm. she's going to tell you about uh, her time as a gymnast. What? <laughs> and if you watch the Olympics, when they have the free uh, of the floor exercises, you know, where you have to do certain things. I was the be they picked me when I, uh, I was the best for my district. I could do those triple somersaults and come down right on the edge of the where you don't lose points, you know. But uh, that that's another thing I thought, well, I'll never be able to do that again. And um, when, he, when Hitler, before all this happened, they had, Hitler came to Vienna and he has set up a meeting for all the Viennese people to meet at the stadium where he would talk to them. And it's like a football stadium where a lot of people can go there. And um, they picked the best gymnasts from different schools to perform for him and I was one of them and it broke my mother's heart that I had to do that but you couldn't you couldn't say no I can't go like I said or you go to the concentration camp I had to wear a uniform and my father refused to buy me a uniform because everybody had to join the Hitler Youth that was mandatory you know and um, but finally he had to buy me one because again they sent an old home you know if she doesn't come in with a uniform the next time you know what's going to happen so anyway I was picked from my school to perform for him and when it was all over I had to go down in front where Hitler sat with all his uh, high generals and everything and shake their hands and my mother's first thing she said go home when you come home wash your hands <laughs> but uh, I forgot to mention that and after that my gymnast days were over I couldn't do nothing anymore um, and I'm still having a lot a lot of problems with my knee and but I'm still alive and that's thanks to God. I think it's, we probably need to stop and have some questions. How, how are we doing on time? Okay. How much more time do we have? What you need. <laughs> well, we could go forever, but well, I don't know. Okay, I, why don't we do some of the kids' questions? Okay, now. okay. Uh, she has a whole lot more she could tell you, uh, but she's covered some of the main things. Uh, she had some funny things happen to her uh, that are in the book. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, she was a typical young girl and uh, she got into some situations and I tell some of those in the book, but uh, one in particular, I'll tell real quick. She uh, used to spend the summers before Hitler came to Vienna with, uh, she would go out during her summer vacation from school and spend time with her uncle who lived, an aunt who lived in the countryside about an hour or so away from Vienna. And she would go by train and uh, visit them for a couple of weeks in the summer. Well, uh, in Germany, in Austria, uh, they, it's, it's just understood that you have wine with your meals and, and uh, it, it flows at, at meals as, as much as water does here. So. Uh, it was nothing for the workers to take a bottle of wine with them to the field to work. And if they ran out, every farmer had a uh, cellar, they, a wine cellar, where they produced their own wine from their own grapes each year. And so somebody would go back from the field to get and fill the bottle. Well, they had this siphon technique that you used to get it out of the big barrel where it was stored in the cellar into the bottle. And you would siphon it up into this globe of glass and then pour it into the bottle. Well, she had, Rose had seen her cousins do it on the farm, but she had never done it herself. So this day she tells them, I will go do it for you. You do not have to go, I will go back and do it. She's all of 10 years old. So she goes back and in the process of siphoning the wine out of the barrel, 
she drinks more wine than she gets into the bottle. <laughs> if you ever siphoned anything, you know how that can happen sometimes. Yes. So by the time she got the bottle half filled, she had about three bottles worth of wine in her, and she passed out. And so the cousins in the field got worried for about, after about an hour, and they went and found her passed out. So she was the talk of the little village, the little girl who got soused on, on the wine. So there are some fun stories in the book as well. Uh, these, these questions that you uh, gave to uh, Ms. Sutton are, are excellent. We, we I'm amazed. Like, I'm really amazed. We talked about it on the way over here this morning. Uh, I printed them out for her to read. and uh, So we want to try and cover as many of these as we can. Um, and she's kind of, kind of already talked about a couple of these, but let me ask it anyway. Rose, how did you cope after seeing the terrible things done to people, to the people? Like on the street, how did, the I cope with that? How did you cope with that? Well, first of all, I would think of Mother, my little friend, you know. I would have done anything for her. And I thought about all the other people that I knew, store owners, business people, that they were gone, you know, they were all gone. And you wonder what happened to them. And I just, the churches were closed, you couldn't go and pray or talk to a priest or nothing. So all I did was pray. And that's the only thing that got me through. Uh, no matter what happened, I asked God to give me the strength to pray, to help me. I never asked for help for myself, for other people, you know. That's how I got through. And that's how I get through life this day. When things go wrong, I go to a quiet place and pray. He has never, never forsaken me. How uh, have you been back to Austria since the war ended? Uh, my, my trip home was, my last trip was eight years ago. And uh, they were still building some of the buildings up. As a matter of fact, the building that I lived in was just finished being rebuilt. And uh, my school was being rebuilt completely new. And it was wonderful to see all the places. Can I say, tell my experience with the butcher shop? It's your program. Uh, in, in Austria, we have, we have horse butcher shops and you can go to a butcher shop and buy horse meat and it's not illegal you know I mean they eat that you know so um, I used when I used to when I was a little kid and somebody gave me a nickel or something for an errand I used to go to the horse butcher shop and buy me a piece of bologna because it is the best bologna in the world. We'll take so, a word for that. <laughs> so so my aunt, they were all making bets when I came home. They said, I bet the first trip is going to be to get a piece of bologna. And it was. I went to the butcher shop and got a piece of bologna. And, uh, you know, I don't know what I ate during the war. There was no more dogs, no more cats, cats, cats. You, you don't know if you're eating a cat that tastes like chicken. I probably, I don't know how many cats. I don't know, you know. Okay, let's move along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they haven't had a lunch yet. So. Okay. Um, one question is just very simply, are you happy now? I'm, I'm very, very happy. I um, enjoy my life with my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I'm still working. And uh, that keeps me busy. I try to help people. I can't stop doing that. That's just my calling. And my kids say, Mom, you're 90 years old. Please slow down. <laughs> you know, these people, they can do it on their own. I said, no, I, I just, that's just me. I got to help people. She still drives. She goes everywhere. Why did you want to help? In other words, when you saw this situation with the Jews, 
Was it MARTA or what happened? It was, well, part of it was MARTA, but uh, Jesus put us on this world to help each other. If I see that you need something or need some help, I'm not going to turn my head and not, not do it. Again, like I said, that's just me. And uh, if nobody feels like, oh, well, somebody else will help them, you don't know if somebody else will help them. You know, so you go ahead and do it. Uh, back to that question about, or you've responded that you still work. They want to know what, what you do, what, what kind of work you do. I'm a church secretary. For her Catholic church. Yeah. And it is a busy job, and sometimes she usually tries to work just once or twice a week, but there have been times when she's worked all week, and it's a hard job. It really is. It is. It's a very hard job. Um, okay, this, do you think something like the Nazi invasion will happen again? Absolutely. It's happening now in the Middle East. It's happening with the terrorist attacks, you know, if the people don't stay strong and it, it's happening everywhere. And not to the same effect as Hitler did it, but who knows, somebody may come along that is just as crazy as he was, you know. And yes, it could happen again. Okay. Did you ever want to give up? No. No. Giving up is not, not in my vocabulary. If, if you read the book, you'll find out that when the Gestapo came, she, was, she responded to them like an adult would, not like a child would. <laughs> she was very gutsy with these guys, uh, which most people would have been just, and she told you she was scared, but her demeanor wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't know it by what she said to them a lot. She didn't cover all that, but she was quite uh, spunky, I guess is the word. Um, what was it like to perform in front of Hitler, the, the gymnastics? Well, he, to me, he wasn't even there. I was concentrating on my performance, you know, and that's what I always did. <clears throat> the people in the audience didn't mean nothing, you know, no matter who they were. My performance was the only thing that I was interested in, you know. She kind of plays this down, but she, she was, like she said, a star gymnast. And out of all the schools in Austria, in Vienna, which is a very large city, uh, she was one of just a few, a handful of people that were picked to perform for Hitler. She was that <coughs> good. And this stadium that she's talking about, it was a soccer stadium, we'd call it today but it was the largest stadium, outdoor stadium in Vienna. And I don't know how many thousand it held, but it'd be like the Cowboy Stadium or, or AT&T Stadium today or whatever. It's, it was a huge venue. So, and it was packed because Hitler, people wanted to come and see and hear Hitler. So she had quite an audience that she was performing for that day. Um, She's already covered this, but I'm just going to let her do it again. Who would you say helped you through your stu struggling times as a kid? Helped me through. Who helped you through that? I have to go back to the same question. Above. God. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, she, she mentioned at one point she had to do a lot of lying. And, and uh, the reason was because she couldn't tell anyone, even her parents, about what she was doing to help her uncle. Uh, you have to understand her uncle was sort of estranged from the rest of the family. So she always liked him, not from her. She always kind of was his favorite. And that's the reason he approached her in the first place. But just had it not even been about Hitler, just in the family dynamics, if she had told her mother she was working with her estranged uncle, that would have gotten her in trouble just all by itself. But the fact she was putting the rest of the family in danger by working with them, that's the reason she had to keep all of this so secret. And so she had to lie to her mother, to her grandparents, to just about everybody else in her family. 
about what she was doing. If the question ever came up as to why you're doing this, she had to come up with a lie to cover it, like her stealing or <laughs> taking food, uh, acquiring food. She had to come up with stories as to why she was doing it. I tell you that because being a woman of faith, like Rose is and was even then, she would cry herself to sleep at night, asking God to forgive her for lying to her parents. That's how much it affected her. Uh, and you can imagine that, with, that for a small girl like yourself, a uh, small child, uh, that, that was hard for her to have to do that. Um, a couple more here, Will. Um, how did you end up in Texas? There's a practical one. Oh. <laughs> She just got on a boat and ended up in Dallas. <laughs> um, when the war was over, I worked at at uh, American headquarters. Now, by that time, I was not quite fourteen, and uh, I spoke English, but not very good. I mean. But we all had to learn English in school with Hitler because that was a mandatory subject because he was hoping to win the war and send us all to the English colonists and work there, you know. So I got a job in censorship. That means uh, every letter that came in to Austria had to be censored. And if there was something in the letter that didn't look good to you, you had to cut it out, you know. Anyway, I had to take shorthand, dictation shorthand. I took shorthand in school, but that was in, in Austrian and German. So I had to translate that into English, and it was a mess. <laughs> anyway, I met my husband there, and uh, we got married. A year and a half later. He was a soldier. He yeah. was an American soldier. Yeah, American soldier. And um, that's how I ended up in Texas. He was from San Antonio, so I yeah. came back to, to Texas. Um, okay, quickly. Um, how can we stop racism? Oh. All right. When God made all of us, he said, I'm making, I'm making you in my own image. So that means everyone. So you see a black person, you see a Chinese person, remember they're made in his image. And racism comes mostly starts at home in a family. That's my opinion. Don't please, you know, don't repeat that. That's my opinion. Um, the children, they, they're born. They don't know why they were born black or why they were born yellow or whatever, you know. Uh, it, it's just a sad story and I don't know how to stop it, but I, I said, have faith in God and, you know, when I meet somebody on the street, my, my children always say to me, Gengi, why do you always smile at everybody? Do you know these people? And I said, no, I don't. Why do you smile at them? I said, because maybe nobody else smiles at them, you know. But uh, uh, that's the only way you can stop racism, racism. yeah. Can I tell one more story about her? I'll, <clears throat> I'll let you. Well, um, she got married at 17, right? You had to get your parents' permission. I was 16. 16, yeah. sorry. And uh, she had to get her parents' permission, so they had to journey back to Austria from, uh, well, she was in Austria, but they had to go back to her home city of Vienna. They were in, uh, uh, where were you when you got married? Salzburg. 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 Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I wrote the book. I can't remember. Um, anyway, she had to. She um, had never been to 
on an army base, uh, which was in Salzburg. They had the American base there after the war, and her husband was stationed there, so they were there. And he had to go out on a, on a, into the field to do something, and so he told her, go to the commissary, which is like the store on the base, and get um, uh, some, some stuff for us to eat. She had never been to any type of grocery store such as this before, and she spoke English fairly well, but the written, some of the written words she didn't know, and unless there was a picture on the can or whatever, she wasn't sure what was in it. And so she went and she just kind of followed the other women around and looked for things and she would see them getting several cans of something so she would get it and put it in her basket, not really knowing what she was getting half of the time. So she gets home and her husband comes home from the field a few days later and he's looking through the stuff that she's gotten. Oh, by the way, she had not had bananas at all during the war, so she got a stalk of bananas and on her bus ride back to the apartment uh, after shopping, I'm interjecting this, she had eaten all of the bananas. <laughs> so all that was in the sack were peels. So when her husband said, what's this? She said, oh, I'm sorry, I ate all the bananas. She didn't tell him on the bus ride home. But anyway, he goes through the cans and he's looking at all and he turns to her and he's smiling and he says, Rose, we don't have a dog. Why did you get all of this cans of dog food? She had like six or eight cans of dog food because one of the other women obviously had a dog and she was eating dog. Rose said, must be good. She's getting lots of cans, so I'm going to put some in my bag. Oh my so, God. so anyway, there are some fun stories about some of her uh, escapades in the book. And we just want to say again, thank you so much for having us today. It's been a real joy to be with you. And I just want to thank uh, uh, everyone for inviting us to be here and I hope you uh, get a chance to read the book and I uh, hope you can come to the March of Remembrance in April. I'm going to leave some material for your teachers to have on that so we can remind you of it and uh, thanks again. Thank you. One thing I want to say before okay. I leave, okay? Oh, During the war my mother, my father, my grandmother, the whole family, we had a pact that no matter what happens, you know, you go to bed at night, you're mad at your mother for some reason, or your brother or your sister. We said we would never, never go to bed angry at each other. We would always make up and apologize because you didn't know if you were alive the next day. We got bombed every day. You could t set your watch by 11 o'clock. So, and also, we would never leave the house going to school or anything when we were mad at each other. Always say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Forgiving is the most important thing. If you do something wrong that hurt you deeply, Please forgive them. It's the hardest thing is to forget it. But in order to forgive, you also have to forget. That takes a little more out of you, the forgetting. But never leave your house angry at each other or go to bed angry at each other. Please do that. Remember that. for you to share these stories with us but we we truly appreciate you being here thank you for having me yeah. yeah. we're so thankful that you're here